Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Paul Schultz. I'm at the Mischer Neuroscience Institute, which is a joint collaboration between Memorial Hermann Hospital and the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. We have a wonderful, large neurology, neurosurgery, neurocritical care group that is involved in all aspects of the nervous system. I specialize in an area called neuropsychiatry, which in which I see people with symptoms that could be neurologic or psychiatric in origin. For people over the age of 50, uh, neurologic and psychiatric symptoms are often related to dementia. And that's a uh, area of great interest to me for many years now. Um, thank you for coming this afternoon. What I'm going to do is walk us through a number of uh, wonderful new findings related to Alzheimer's disease specifically. If you have questions along the way, you can type them in. They'll show up on my screen here. And what I'm probably going to do is wait and answer them near the end. I don't think you can see each other's questions, but I'll, I'll know that they're there. And uh, if they're very topical to the slide that I'm on, I'll answer them at that time. Otherwise, if I know that there's something I'm going to say about that later, perhaps I'll wait till the end. Dementia is something that confuses folks in terms of how it differs from Alzheimer's disease. So let me just start out by explaining to everybody that dementia is sort of the big picture item and Alzheimer's is one kind of dementia. So in general, we define dementia as having impairment in two areas. An example would be memory and language or memory and getting lost. And then they have to reach a point where it affects a person's daily life. It can't just be like our normal age-associated stuff that all of us have. It has to actually affect our work life or our home life or our uh, religious life and so forth. If we have those two areas of impairment plus uh, a change in our activities of daily living, we call that dementia. And then as a neurologist, my job is to figure out which of the many, many kinds of dementia might be relevant. Uh, some examples that I listed here at the bottom of this slide include uh, vascular related dementia. So people that have had the misfortune to have strokes or hemorrhages can have uh, enough impairment to have dementia. There are a number of infections that affect the nervous system like HIV and syphilis and something called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease that might be something you haven't heard about, but we see it. Trauma can cause uh, dementia. And obviously, in that case, it's usually a relatively abrupt onset of some uh, object hitting a person's head, for example. There are uh, a number of other neurodegenerative diseases besides Alzheimer's disease that we see also. In people who are in their 50s, frontotemporal dementia and Lewy body disease are about as common as Alzheimer's disease. In folks that are more like 70, 80, 90, then Alzheimer's disease is a lot more common. But they're all neurodegenerative in the sense that brain cells disappear, they die and go away, and it's very different than if you've had a stroke or if you have a tumor or an abscess and so forth. There's something going on in the cells that cause them to die, and we call those neurodegenerative diseases. We also see dementia in vitamin deficiencies like B12 deficiency, and when there's a hormone dysregulation like low thyroid. For many of you probably get your thyroid levels checked every year and wonder why that is, and one of the reasons is that it's a very common cause of cognitive impairment uh, since for so many people the thyroid hormone gets low as we get older. How common is dementia? It is really common. Uh, we estimate that there's at least 5 million people in the United States with Alzheimer's disease alone. And as I mentioned, there's other kinds of dementia as well. Uh, so there's probably 9 or 10 million people in the United States with dementia per se. Interestingly, for Alzheimer's disease, less than half of people with Alzheimer's are actually diagnosed as such. Uh, so that's something that we all need to keep in mind because even though we're doing a lot of, of research and so forth and getting to the bottom of what's going on, and even though hopefully more treatments will be coming out, uh, the first step is going to be to diagnosing people so that they can be treated when we discover stuff. Since Texas has... Mm, about 38 million people, I think it's close to 10% of the population. That means that 
there's about 340,000 Texans with Alzheimer's disease. So almost everybody knows people with Alzheimer's disease. It's, unfortunately, if it was a business, we'd call it a growth industry because it's so darn common nowadays. And of course, that has to do with the fact that we've made great strides with heart disease, cancer, and stroke. And now that they're less prevalent, uh, all of us fortunately are living longer, but that means that the challenges that come with living longer, like Alzheimer's disease, become more apparent. And that, of course, is motivating all of us who are getting older to study this uh, more so. This graph just shows uh, the number of people in the United States over the age of 45. And as you can see, uh, over the next uh, 40 years, we'll be going from about 125 million to 200 million. And that means, of course, that there's a lot more folks who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease, again, motivating us to work on uh, solving this disorder. What are the symptoms of dementia? How would you think to go see your physician or neurologist? I, I divide the symptoms into what I call ABC, and that keeps it easy for me to remember as well. But I think most people think of the C before the B and the A. The C is cognitive changes. Those are the things you think of like memory problems, language problems, concentration problems, finding your way around problems, operating household appliances, and so forth. We call those cognitive changes. Behavior changes, believe it or not, are very common also. People may notice a change in personality in their loved one. They may notice hallucinations, aggression, agitation, repetitive behaviors, almost OCD-like, and many other behaviors that can change in a person. And affect is the one that perhaps people associate the least with dementia. Affect refers to how people feel mood-wise. Depression, anxiety, happy, sad, apathetic, manic, all of those are referred to as uh, affective. Believe it or not, probably half of the people that I see with Alzheimer's disease have an affective change before they develop the cognitive changes. So if somebody has never suffered from depression or anxiety during their life, and they start developing it in their 50s or 60s or 70s, that's often a red flag for something going on. And that can, in fact, be the first sign of dementia. If you think about it, everything that goes on in us as humans comes from our brain. And so if dementia can affect the thinking parts of our brain, it makes sense that it would also affect the mood part of our brain and the behavior part of, change of our brain. So all of those can be symptoms of dementia, ABC, affect, behavior, cognition. The better word for affect is mood, but I couldn't think of a good acronym with uh, C, B, and M. So I went with ABC. If you decide uh, that you or your loved one has symptoms of dementia, or you're worried about that, what are we going to do to you? How bad is it going to hurt? What's it going to, what's going to be involved if you come see us? Well, we're probably the least painful thing people to see in medicine. We do a history and physical. I'll give you some tests, like I'll ask you to remember some things. I'll ask you to draw some things. Uh, and depending on the results of all those, we may do an MRI scan of the brain, if needed, to take a look at what's going on. We may do some blood work. We may do longer cognitive testing, if I can't decide for sure what's going on. Once in a great while, we'll do an electroencephalogram, a brainwave test. That's exactly like an EKG, except the electrodes are on your head. It doesn't hurt at all. Probably the only thing I do that ever hurts would be a lumbar puncture. But honestly, it's very rare. I probably do it one in a hundred or less times. Most of the time, I can figure out what's going on with someone without doing that. And a PET or a SPEC scan are also very easy. They're just like a CAT scan. They're pretty rapid, and uh, they don't have quite the claustrophobia issues that MRIs have. You lay in a pretty big open donut. All of those things there are very helpful to us. As I'm going to tell you in a minute, one of the reasons why uh, we go through all of this is that uh, up until very recently, we really have not had a way of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease specifically. And as a result of that, we had to do a lot of work, ask you a lot of questions, and, and uh, have you do a lot of things to figure out our best guess about what's going on. And then all of the screening tests, uh, like MRI and so forth, were basically to rule out other causes, like we'd rule out strokes and tumors and abscesses, and then we'd be left with Alzheimer's disease. The exciting thing I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes is we've now got a much more specific way of diagnosing them. Um, we're still going to do a lot of these same things because we still have to rule out other things, but we're going to be able to in the very near future uh, for everybody. And right now, in some cases, we can uh, diagnose Alzheimer's disease a lot more specifically. 
One question people ask me is, well, what if I bring my spouse in to see you? Uh, does it make a difference? Are you going to be able to do anything for them? And I want to tell you that, that there is a lot that can be done. Um, for certain things, we don't have a cure. But for a lot of things, we can have a big impact. I'll give you an example. Sometimes I find out that people's memory impairment is related to little strokes that they didn't know were going on. If we stop those strokes, the person stops getting any worse. That's obviously way different than a person who doesn't come in and continues to have strokes and uh, may, get, may get a lot worse. Uh, people think about strokes as causing weakness and numbness and so forth. And they certainly can do that. But that's actually a very small part of the brain. Most of your brain is involved in thinking. And so if you have strokes in those areas, you don't get weak or numb or have a facial droop. You just notice a change in your memory. And as a result of that, I, as I mentioned, it's really important to come in and see us if you have cognitive issues. Because if it's stroke-related stuff, we can really have a big impact on that. Infection is the same way. Tumor is the same way. And then even if we get to a neurodegenerative disease, if we say, well, it looks like it's Alzheimer's or frontotemporal disease or Lewy body disease, we can still have a pretty big impact on quite a few symptoms. One example is mood. As I mentioned, more than half of people have mood disorders. And depression and anxiety are very uncomfortable for people, obviously. They're really negative feelings. It kind of reminds me of nausea and vomiting. There's really nothing worse than that. And it makes a huge impact in people's lives if we can um, make them feel better. In fact, a lot of people with dementia really don't even know they have it. And they don't suffer very much like, like their caregivers. But they do suffer if their mood is not very good. And we can have a big impact on that. We can also affect their behavior, which makes it a lot better for family members. Um, it's one thing to have someone who's forgetful. But if they're aggressive at the same time, Obviously, that can be really disruptive to the household. The cognitive aspects, I think, is, again, what everybody thinks of with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And the medications we have certainly aren't curative, but they do have an impact on the course of things. And so even in that case, I would argue that we, we have a positive impact. And of course, the big thing is that we're all doing a lot of research on this. And uh, so being diagnosed is critical so that as soon as we do have something that affects Alzheimer's disease, specifically to a greater extent, we're going to be able to get it for you and your loved ones. One of the really huge changes that's occurred in just the last five years for those of us taking care of people with dementia is the recognition that dementia is not always inevitable. We can actually, A, figure out uh, risk factors for dementia, and B, we're starting to show that controlling those risk factors has an impact on whether or not someone develops dementia. Let me tell you about some of those, because these are things you can do in an active way right now to try to prevent dementia in yourself or a loved one who's at risk for it. There are some things I still can't change risk factor-wise. We know that age and gender and heredity are out there. And they all have an impact on the risk of developing dementia. There's several things that we've talked about over the years or been worried about, like aluminum skillets or antiperspirants or aspartame. Honestly, it's been really difficult to show that any of those are related to the development of dementia. Um, but on the other side of the coin, we've now got about 10 or 15 different factors that we can actually have an effect on. Let me tell you about some of them. Hypertension, uh, I abbreviated HTN there, about the third one down on the left, says 1.5. What I mean by that is that hypertension increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 1.5 fold. That means it's 50% more likely in people with hypertension than in people without hypertension. Diabetes increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease about 1.76 fold. So it's 76% more likely in diabetics. This is really sort of unbelievable, honestly, for folks who uh, study this like myself. We knew for the last couple of decades that diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and so forth are very important for heart disease and for stroke. But it turns out that they also affect the development of dementia separate from their production of strokes and heart attacks. Hyperlipidemia refers to elevated cholesterol or elevated triglycerides listed down below there. Those are also big risk factors. They also have about a one and a half to two-fold increase in the risk of developing dementia. Smoking is a huge risk factor, it turns out. This is just a study that came out about three months ago by some colleagues who published it in the journal Neurology. 
we knew that it increased the chances of strokes about three and a half times, but it turns out that it increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease about 2.6 times. Obesity in midlife, and by that I don't mean morbid obesity, meaning very large, I mean uh, having a BMI over 25. BMI is a ratio of height to weight, and we use that so that people of different heights you know, can be compared and all that. Um, there's a lot of tables on the web that you can look up if you just type in the word basal metabolic index, and you can see where you stand. I don't think I'm very uh, heavy, to be honest, but it turns out my BMI is close to 25, and 25 to 30 is actually uh, considered to be obese, and then over 30 is considered to be morbid obesity. This study that came out just a couple months ago also showed that people who are in their 40s and 50s who have a larger waistline uh, have a 3.8-fold increase in the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Let me mention that people come and ask me, well, my, my mother had Alzheimer's disease. What does that do to my risk? And if I tell them they have double the risk of other people, they get very worried about it. And of course, they should be worried. But at the same time, look at these numbers here that I've shown you already. Smoking two and a half, two point six. So it turns out that smoking is a bigger risk factor than heredity. Obesity is a bigger risk factor than heredity by double almost. Um, uh, hypertension also, diabetes, and so forth. Now let me mention three risk factors that are very new. One is TBI, which stands for traumatic brain injury. That means getting bumped on the head hard enough to be knocked out for just a couple of minutes. It turns out that that is, we showed uh, here recently in a paper, that that is associated with a fourfold increase in frontotemporal dementia, which I mentioned is another neurodegenerative disease, almost as common as an Alzheimer's disease, especially in the 50s and 60s. The second one in the list there, PTSD, is post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of you have heard about that because of all the servicemen coming back from overseas who uh, suffer from that. I have to say that 10 or 20 years ago, I thought of that as being predominantly a psychological adjustment disorder, very, uh, very difficult for people, very challenging, causing a lot of uh, negative symptoms in people. But what happened is in the last few years, we've been studying PTSD, and we've found that it's associated with a 2.6-fold increase in the risk of dementia. That's given us the idea now that PTSD isn't just a psychologic disorder. It's actually producing changes in people's brains that may be relevant to the development of uh, dementia down the road. And the last one I want to mention down at the right bottom there is transmissibility. One of my lab colleagues at uh, Herman uh, University of Texas named Dr. Soto showed recently that he could transmit Alzheimer's disease from one mouse to another. Now that's very different than from human to human, and we don't have any evidence for that occurring in humans, but we're studying that now. Now that he showed that it could be done in mice, we're looking at it in humans. It turns out that only about 5% of Alzheimer's disease is hereditary, meaning that there's a specific gene that we know of that runs in a family. That means that 95% of Alzheimer's disease is caused by things that we don't know. And obviously, we've mentioned a number of risk factors here. But what we still don't know in most cases is what actually caused it. Why did this person, this individual, actually get it? And one of the hypotheses we're testing then is transmissibility, uh, since it was shown to be true in mice. There's also a number of risk factors now that go in the other direction. They're actually helpful for reducing the risk of dementia. Diet, it turns out, is a very important one. We don't know of a specific food or food product that I could recommend to you, but what I would say is that the quote-unquote healthy diets uh, are the ones that are relevant to this. Now, obviously, diet has a big effect on hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, elevated triglycerides, obesity, and so forth. So it may be that the way diet works is through all of those. Whatever it is, uh, eating a uh, low-fat, low-cholesterol diet and keeping your weight down turns out to be very helpful for the, the factors in red there, which then uh, result in a reduced risk of dementia developing. Physical exercise is also in the same category there. In fact, even in Alzheimer's disease itself, we've been able to show, and others, that physical exercise slows the course of the disease. 
In fact, it's even better than mental exercise, which I listed there. Mental exercise is very helpful, and I tell all my patients to engage in that. Uh, the more they active they are mentally, uh, the better they do in terms of cognitive function. But it turns out that physical exercise, for reasons that we don't understand yet, is even more helpful for slowing the course of dementia or for reducing the risk of it than mental exercise. Now, of course, physical exercise together with diet also affect a lot of the factors on the left there that I mentioned. And it may be as simple as that, or it may be more complicated. For example, exercise results in more oxygen being carried. It may result in less free radicals. It may result in uh, lower weight. There may be a lot of different ways that it's effective. It may also result in the release of growth factors that are involved in making muscle stronger and so forth. And those growth factors may in some way be relevant to what goes on in the brain. We just don't know yet. But the finding that's been repeated many times now is that physical exercise is very helpful. By that I mean about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, three to four times a week has been shown to be very helpful. One of the factors I mentioned here at, uh, we discovered at uh, UT Herman is transmissibility in mice. And again, this was a paper by my colleague, Dr. Soto, whose name is the last one on the uh, list there. The last guy is always the senior guy in uh, publications, by the way. Um, you can see here that uh, on the left side, I wrote the word not inoculated. So these are mice that did not get inoculated by tissue from a mouse that was going to develop Alzheimer's disease. On the right side, excuse me, the word inoculated means that these mice, at the same age as the ones on the left, had been inoculated with tissue from an animal that was going to get Alzheimer's disease. Now the nice thing about studying mice is that you can have a whole colony, all of which came from two parents. Uh, they divide and divide, and they're all genetically related. They're all in the same environment. Uh, there's no variability between them. And so if you transfect a gene into some of the mice for Alzheimer's disease, you know they're going to get it versus the other mice. And you know that everything else about them is identical. So in this case, what happened is mice that had the gene for Alzheimer's disease uh, gave up some tissue, which was put in the animals that weren't going to get Alzheimer's disease, uh, such as blood or uh, brain tissue. And it turned out that, as you can see there, there's these brown staining areas marked by an arrow. Those brown staining areas are the amyloid deposits that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. So the mice on the right, who did not have the gene for Alzheimer's, got Alzheimer's changes in their brain related to having been inoculated by tissue from another mouse. So that gave us the idea, as I mentioned, that there might be a transmissible component. And we're looking for that in humans right now. This is just a little bigger scale there uh, showing the plaques. Those are the brown staining things in the leftmost and the second to the left figure. Interestingly, if you look there, you can see the inoculated row was the mouse that was not destined to get Alzheimer's disease, but got tissue from an Alzheimer's mouse. And you can see the big plaques that developed in their brain. The bottom row where it says genetic means that those were the animals that were given the human gene to develop Alzheimer's disease. And sure enough, they developed big plaques. But you can see that the plaques look identical in the mouse that had the gene for Alzheimer's and the mouse that didn't have the gene, but who got tissue from a mouse who was going to get Alzheimer's disease. Traumatic brain injury is something that's been in the, in the news a lot lately. And as I mentioned, we've been looking at that with regard to Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal disease, which are two neurodegenerative diseases that affect us and produce dementia. As I mentioned, just a couple of weeks ago, this paper of ours came out showing that uh, the chances that someone with FTD would have been knocked out once during their life is four times as common as people with other kinds of dementias. So we looked at 63 people with frontotemporal disease on the left side of this figure versus 490 people with other dementias. Uh, and the risk of having been knocked out was four times as common. Now that's a little different than saying that the head trauma caused the dementia, because this wasn't that kind of a study. But when you find an association like this between head trauma and dementia, it makes you very suspicious that one's causing the other. We did this study amongst dementia patients. So it was people coming to the same clinic, the same age, uh, other kinds of dementia. And that way, we ruled out a lot of other variables that might affect uh, whether we found something or not. 
And uh, now there are other studies that have been done where we look at dementia versus controls, meaning without uh, any dementia. And we have a similar sort of finding, but in this case we wanted to be certain that it was only related to the type of dementia. When we did the same analysis for Alzheimer's disease, it's about twice as common. In other words, people with Alzheimer's disease are twice as likely to have been knocked out once during their life as others. Many of you may have heard in the news about football players and other sports-related uh, injuries that are being associated with dementia. And I've seen some really fascinating uh, publications now, and uh, I was at a meeting just recently where the lady who discovered that from my alma mater, Boston University, showed some striking uh, pathologic slides of people even in their 20s who had been knocked out in a football game uh, who then maybe were in a car accident and uh, unfortunately were killed. She was able to look at their brains and she already found changes in them in just in the years right after the bump on the head. Uh, so you can imagine that 50 years later uh, those same changes would be relevant to the dementia that I'm seeing uh, in folks. The last one I'm going to mention specifically because we've been very involved in that is post-traumatic stress disorder. As I mentioned, we started out thinking that it was probably an adjustment reaction, but it turns out that so many people are coming back from overseas with this that we're seeing a heck of a lot of it right now in people coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan, and I still see a lot of people who got PTSD in the Vietnam era. Now here at the Memorial Hermann ER, you would say, well, how is that relevant? Well, it turns out that we have the busiest uh, emergency room in the world, and we see more trauma and more what I would call awful events than even the U.S. military. And it's just because we have a large city here and it's so active, and, and our life flight helicopters pe bring people in from all over. It turns out that being caught in a fire in your home, robbery, rape, getting admitted to the hospital with a heart attack, like to the ICU, being in a bad car accident, uh, are just as bad and just as likely to produce PTSD as being in the battlefield. Um, it's about 22% of people coming back from overseas in the military getting PTSD, and our, our best estimate here in the Memorial Hermann ER is about 22% also. So people coming in with a significant stressor like that, uh, about 22% of people have a specific reaction to that that turns out to, in half of them, produce a lifelong series of uh, symptoms that we refer to as post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is just the title page of our paper showing that um, there were, in veterans, which we did this study in first, we found a 2.2-fold increase in dementia in people who had had PTSD. This group was predominantly from the Vietnam era, so they're now in their 60s and 70s, and, uh, and we were able to look at them and follow up with them for all these years and see that uh, they're much more likely to develop uh, dementia than uh, other veterans. We even included, by the way, people who had gotten Purple Hearts. Purple Heart recipients have to have been injured in battle, so obviously they had a lot of physical and mental stress. Uh, but if they didn't develop PTSD, it turned out that the Purple Heart recipients had the same development of dementia as the control veterans who were in the service at the same time who may or may not have seen battle. The PTSD people, again, are very different than either the Purple Heart recipients or the controls. Now I'm going to talk about the, perhaps the most exciting aspect of dementia. And I have to say, as someone who's been studying dementia for several decades, uh, it's unbelievable now uh, what's been going on just here in the last few weeks. As you can sort of glean from what I've said so far by the fact that we have to do so many tests to try to figure out whether someone has Alzheimer's disease, uh, if you said to me, well, gosh, it seems kind of simple to diagnose, isn't it? You could figure out that the answer is no. There's a lot of stuff that looks just like Alzheimer's disease, and it's very different. I mentioned strokes as one example. It can look identical. Uh, getting bumped on the head can look identical. Believe it or not, depression can look identical to Alzheimer's disease. People who come in profoundly depressed uh, often are not paying attention very well, whether they want to or not. They don't remember very well. They look exactly like dementia. We call them pseudo-dementia because they don't have the same changes in their brain that we see in dementia. But they do have changes in their brain biochemically that produces what looks exactly like Alzheimer's disease. And it can be very hard to tell these apart. And obviously, the prognosis is very different. The treatments are different, obviously, too, the point I make in this slide, so that it is important to figure out whether it's Alzheimer's or not. 
For example, if it turns out to be depression, I can tell someone a very different scenario than if it turns out to be strokes or Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and both of those, again, have different treatments as well. I would say depression and strokes are probably the two most difficult ones to differentiate from Alzheimer's. But honestly, as a dementia expert who sees 50 to 100 other reasons why people have cognitive impairment, I often have to scratch my head a little bit and try to figure out whether it's really Alzheimer's disease or not. Sometimes what happens is I've had to follow people for a long time to try to figure out what was going on. So even when I was able to figure it out, sometimes it delayed things. Now I'm going to tell you about this new scan that we have for diagnosing Alzheimer's. In order to do that, I'm going to have to show you one or two science slides here. They're, they're pretty bit straightforward, I hope. And uh, I'll, I'll walk you through them so you can follow what I'm saying. In the top of this figure, there's a protein which has those red arrows going to it. The protein is, is blue on the inside of the cell where it says cell interior. It's kind of green in the cell membrane. And then it's blue again outside of that. It's actually a normal protein that's in all of our brain cells. And it's at the part of the brain cells where one cell connects to the other. You would think that the brain cells would connect directly and make a solid connection, but they don't. And it turns out to be an ingenious system for a lot of reasons. Since they don't connect directly, one brain cell influences another by sending chemicals across the way. Sometimes they're small chemicals, and sometimes it's a big protein. What I've marked here in this figure is a big protein called the amyloid precursor protein. We abbreviate that APP. And that protein sits in the membrane, and under certain circumstances, an enzyme comes along, breaks the protein in the middle, and the, the part that's on the outside of the cell goes floating around and attaches to receptors on other brain cells and influences them. It says, hey, I'm over here, and here's what's going on in my cell. And then it has an influence on the other cells around it. So that's a normal molecule in our brain, the amyloid precursor protein. And it's important in neuronal growth and learning and memory and so forth. Sometimes, however, that normal cascade of events doesn't occur. That normal cascade uses an enzyme called alpha secretase. And that enzyme cleaves this molecule right in the middle of the green part of the cartoon molecule there. When it does that, that a little piece of the green and the blue outside the cell go floating around and do exactly what I just said. Sometimes, though, the alpha secretase is not active. Perhaps the cell is not signaling something. Or sometimes we see mutations in the amyloid precursor protein at the site where the enzyme is supposed to act. And it can't act there properly. Now, in, when that kind of thing goes on, two other enzymes that have other functions and aren't supposed to be involved with this molecule at all find the molecule. And they say, well, here's the sequence of proteins that I'm used to looking at. And whenever I see that, I cut the, enzyme, I cut the protein in half. In the middle figure there on the cartoon, I put the word enzyme. It, these are two enzymes, again, coming along and breaking this molecule, not in the same spot as the alpha secretase listed above. When these two act, they release a different size fragment than you would normally see. They cleave on either side of the green there and produce this green segment of the amyloid precursor protein. And that little green thing is the bad boy that we call beta amyloid. That beta amyloid is very sticky, it turns out. And so when it floats around outside the cells there, especially if it runs into another beta amyloid molecule, it sticks to it. And before you know it, you get large clumps of beta amyloid being deposited. Our thinking is that those clumps of beta amyloid, which we call beta amyloid plaques, are not just benign pieces of schmutz sitting there. We think that they actually initiate a cascade of events that result in the death of the neurons, the brain cells, around them. So if you look at each of these plaques in a brain of someone who has Alzheimer's disease, you see a bunch of neurons or brain cells around them that aren't working right, or they're gone. They've died. So this is obviously a very important molecule, and all of us have been studying this. And we know that this is deposited in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. So if you had to develop a way of diagnosing Alzheimer's disease that's better than the 10 tests that we've had thus far, 
where we have to do a lot of different things to try to get at it, what would you do? Well, you would develop a way of figuring out whether someone is, de is depositing beta amyloid in their brain. And in fact, that's what's going on with our new test called Amavid. The Amavid is a compound uh, that comes in a little, little aliquot of water. It looks like we're giving you a little injection in the vein. We do that, and this stuff goes through your system and then through the brain. And if it sees amyloid, it attaches to it. And then we can visualize that with a PET scan. We can look at your brain and see if you have amyloid that's attaching to this molecule. And if there's a lot of it, then we know that people either have Alzheimer's disease or they're at risk for it. Now let me tell you one or two more facts before I show you some examples of this. This is something that I think is kind of astounding and, and gives us great hope for preventing Alzheimer's disease. And that is that the amyloid that I've been talking about, we now know, is being deposited for anywhere between 10 and 30 years before people develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. That's hugely important. That means that we have a 10 to 30 year period where we could try to detect this stuff and try to turn off the deposition of it or find a way of getting rid of it before people develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And by the way, even when people develop the symptoms of the disease, it's usually a few years before I see them. So the total time between the initiation of amyloid deposition and when I diagnose someone is anywhere from 10 plus 3, meaning 13 years, to 33 years after they've actually started depositing this stuff. So you could see that it's not only going to be useful to image this stuff in people to diagnose Alzheimer's, but to figure out how to do this before people have Alzheimer's disease in order to prevent the development of it. Right now, we're working on ways of tackling the amyloid in people with Alzheimer's disease like reducing the amyloid production with drugs, blocking the aggregation with drugs. Of course, we haven't found the cure in this regard, or, or you would know about that already, but we and many other people are studying that. Um, we're all looking at ways of trafficking the beta amyloid out of the nervous system. And I think that may be the most exciting method under study right now. There's 29 trials right now of antibodies going on, where the antibody goes into the nervous system and attaches to the amyloid, and we're looking now to see whether it traffics the amyloid out of the brain. If it does, then you could imagine that putting the amavid scan to detect the amyloid together with the antibody here to get rid of it might in fact result not only in helping people with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but potentially even preventing it before they develop that. Our thought also that I want to mention to you is that some of the trials we've done in Alzheimer's disease have not been fruitful, but when we have the opportunity to try these same medications on people before they develop the disease, we're going to do that. Why? Our thought is that once people develop the disease, it may be too late to have an impact. At that point, even if we get rid of the amyloid, it may be too late to stop the process that's going on. So that there's another whole area of hope for us, which is that we're going to go back and try some of the medications that we did in Alzheimer's disease before people develop it and see whether or not we don't have a bigger impact. So our approach right now is essentially the following. We're looking at all the risk factors that we can that are uh, shown on the left here that I've already mentioned to you that may have an influence on the, de on the deposition of beta amyloid. And we're looking at how the reduction of each of those factors reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease. We've already shown, for example, that controlling hypertension and diabetes has a big impact on the development of Alzheimer's disease. So those two simple things already we can show reduces the risk of it. And of course, I mentioned earlier that there's other things we can do that we think uh, affect Alzheimer's disease once it develops. And we're looking to see whether or not it has an impact on the development of it by uh, invoking them even before people have the disease. Now I'm going to show you the new diagnostic test that I think is going to help us both for people with Alzheimer's and for the circumstances I just mentioned, which is people before they develop the disease, hopefully. Here's an example of one of these Amavid scans. And let me walk you through this so you understand what we're looking at. 
on the upper right, actually the lower left is probably the easiest one to visualize, that's a CAT scan of a person's brain. Okay, We're looking crosswise, so it's like from ear to ear, and the person's nose would be at the top of this. Okay, The grayish tissue in the middle is brain, and the white around it is the person's skull. So this is a pretty normal looking CAT scan there. There's a nice brain, and uh, there's no pieces missing, there's no strokes in there. There's no areas of degeneration, and it fills the whole skull. That would be a normal-looking brain. If we look at the top right there, this is after giving a person the amavid, And it turns out that in the deep parts of the brain, the amavid sometimes nonspecifically binds, and it looks dark there. But around the outside of the brain, which is where all your brain cells are, you can see that it's very gray, meaning that there's no amavid attaching there. The upper left picture is a combination of two. It's the CAT scan from down below showing us the structure of the brain and the AMOVID scan right under the word normal there uh, where we've colorized it so that instead of black and white it's shades of yellow and red and we've superimposed those two in the upper left there. That would be a normal scan. It's a good CAT scan, normal looking brain, and the amavid is in the deep areas, but it's not in the cortex, not in the surrounding part of the brain where all your brain cells are. We would say that's a negative scan. This person is not depositing uh, amyloid. And this is a higher cut of the same kind of person. They're showing exactly the same thing. Now I'm going to show you something that is really intriguing to me, and that is a person with a normal CAT scan again, and yet who has a positive amavid scan. The bottom left there is a picture of a CAT scan that looks normal. For decades I've been looking at normal CAT scans like this, or abnormal ones, and trying to figure out, looking at them, whether the person has Alzheimer's disease or not. If the scan is abnormal, the CAT scan, well then I can say it looks like an Alzheimer's disease change. But when it's normal like this, I've never been able to tell people what's going on. I can just say, well, I mean, it's good that the, the CAT scan looks good, but it doesn't tell me what's going on in your brain. I can see there's no strokes and no tumors and abscesses, but I can't tell you for sure what's going on there. This Amavid scan, though, is unbelievable if you look at it. If you look at the upper right scan there, uh, instead of having the deep, dark areas and the surrounding parts of the brain being white, you can see that the darkness goes all the way to the surface of the brain. In fact, it's really intensely dark in the frontal lobes, which is at the top there, and then in the temporal lobes, which are on the sides, right under the person's ear. That would be a positive Amavid scan. When we colorize that and super out, superimpose it over the CAT scan, which is what you see in the upper left there, you can see that it's very different than the previous patient. This patient's CAT scan is okay, but there's yellow going all the way out to just under the skull there. And remember, all of your brain cells are on the outside of the brain. And so this means that this person has amyloid right where the brain cells are, and that's not a good deal. This would be someone who has Alzheimer's disease clinically. This is just another cut of the same person showing very intense staining all the way down. Now I'm going to show you a couple of patients that I've seen recently where this scan has been particularly helpful to me and to the patient and their family. This first one is a kind of young guy. By young, I mean not much a difference in age than me who has had depression on and off during his life. And depression, uh, in some people, probably a third of people, can last a year or two or more before it's helped or before it goes away. Persons with that are very hard to tell from Alzheimer's disease because when they're profoundly depressed, their brain doesn't work very well either. This gentleman came in just after the start of a new depression episode, and they'd always lasted a few years in him. So I knew we were going to have to wait a couple of years before we would be able to examine him when he wasn't depressed, and we could find out whether or not he had any cognitive changes. But his wife brought him in because she was pretty sure that his thinking was different than it had been in any of the previous times when he uh, suffered from a spell of depression. So I thought about what we could do to try to diagnose Alzheimer's disease or not in this guy. I was hoping we could give his family reassurance that he was OK, for example. This image that I'm showing you here now is an Amavid scan from him. Probably the easiest one to see is in the lower left there. This is looking 
not from uh, the top like we did in the previous images. This is looking straight on at a person. So this is uh, the cameras in front of their face looking at their brain. And the darkness there is, uh, is the amavid contrast. You can see here that there's some areas that are normal. So if you look at the bottom left image and look at the upper right of it, there's some gray area over the dark area. And that would be a normal part of brain. But if you look on the other side, the left-hand side of the image, you can see that the darkness goes all the way out to right under the skull there. And I, I, I have to tell you that my heart sunk when I saw this because it meant that his wife's sense that there was something not right about him beyond the depression turned out to be true. This gentleman uh, is unfortunately depositing a bunch of amyloid in his brain. And, uh, and I you know, unfortunately was able to tell the two of them that this was a different circumstance and that Alzheimer's disease is going on in addition to the depression. Now the advantage is instead of waiting three years until his depression was over, I was able to tell them now at this time that, uh, that he uh, uh, has Alzheimer's disease. We didn't have to delay the treatment then. This is his superimposed scan there. You can see uh, the yellowness is the uh, amyloid deposition. And you can see that it goes almost all the way out to the skull. And it's very homogeneous, meaning it's everywhere. It's not just in the deep areas as it is non-specifically in the normal scans. The second patient is someone who's older and presents with just memory impairment and nothing else. So this is a gentleman who is cognitively otherwise doing very well. And he doesn't forget everything. He just forgets a number of things. Clinically, we would call him an amnestic MCI, meaning that he, he doesn't meet criteria for Alzheimer's disease. He doesn't have two areas of impairment. And it's not really affecting his life. And of course, it turns out he's retired. But at the same time, he's still having a, a wonderful time doing things that, that folks you know, do and take advantage of when they're retired. But he has uh, you know, noticeable memory loss. And so we evaluated him and, uh, and, and showed, in fact, that uh, if I give him a list of words to remember, like three or four or five words, he might remember half of them, uh, and sometimes even less than that. So this is a gentleman who I was worried about then might be at risk for Alzheimer's disease down the road. In the past, we weren't able to tell which of these kind of people were going to go on to develop Alzheimer's and which weren't. So we did an Amavid scan on him. And I have to tell you, it's, uh, it was, again, a really amazing thing to see as someone who's been studying this for a long time. Here's an example of a cut at the ear level. At the top of this image is actually his eyes, those, those white things there that don't have any um, contrast in them. So it's at the eye nose level looking backwards. The left side of the screen is his right temporal lobe. And you can see that it's pretty dark everywhere. The right side of the screen is his other temporal lobe, and it's moderately dark. Now, this corresponds with the fact that he has memory impairment, because this is the part of the brain the memory uh, occurs in. And I can see here that the amyloid deposition may well be related to the fact that he's developing memory impairment. Here's a superimposition again, showing the amount of amyloid being deposited. The amazing thing to me as someone who studies this is that you can't tell the difference between his scan and the previous gentleman's scan. And yet, clinically, they're totally different. This guy has mild memory impairment. And the other poor gentleman is cognitively very affected by the amyloid deposition. This is telling us something about the biology of the disease here, where it appears that you can have two people with the same amount of amyloid being deposited. And depending on how their brain reacts to it, they may be having very different symptoms from that. Now, this is higher up in the brain of the guy who's 80 years old, who just has mild memory impairment, it shows that he's depositing amyloid throughout his brain. It's not just in the memory impairment area, but he doesn't have any symptoms related to any of this. In the bottom part of the screen there, th those dark areas, they uh, correspond to the areas that allow a person to find their way around. So as you know, a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease come in and say they can't find their car or they can't find the bathroom in their house anymore. That's because of changes in the parietal area, which is this area of the brain there in the back. This gentleman has a lot of amyloid being deposited there and yet has no problem finding his way anywhere. Again, it's telling us something about what's going on in the disease that we've never had insight into before. At the same time, I could tell this gentleman 
hey, you know what, you're depositing amyloid already. We need to look at all your risk factors. We need to get your cholesterol under better control, your blood pressure, and so forth, so that we reduce the risk of your going on to developing Alzheimer's disease. And this last patient I'm going to show you very briefly is a woman who's also around her 80s. And she actually has some little strokes on her MRI scan. These are MRI images there. And if you, uh, you can see some areas of uh, white spots there. Those are little strokes that she's had. And the question she had was, is that all that's going on with me? And if you prevent me from having more strokes, am I going to be OK? Am I going to be stabilized? Or do I have something else going on that's going to cause change? So we did an amavid scan on her. And you probably can figure out yourself now by looking at this that she has amyloid much more than just the deep areas that are nonspecifically stained. She has it in the, in the cortex as well. So we were able to, you know, for better or for worse, we were able to say that you have more than just those little strokes going on there. And again, we need to do all the things we can to try to prevent uh, more deposition of amyloid. So you can see that our study of the risk factors uh, for dementia development are going to be very fruitful in terms of identifying more and more things that are risk factors and preventing them in people. This imaging, we hope, is going to be very useful not only for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease, but for identifying people before they develop it on whom we can do risk factor management, or even more than that, uh, as we develop more treatments to uh, help prevent progression to Alzheimer's. I think I just have a couple more slides here basically summarizing this. But I think what I'm going to do is stop now because it's uh, 12.54 by my clock. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them in there. And I will uh, try to answer them in the remaining time there. So one, let's see, uh, uh, one person says, if a parent has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the early 70s, what steps can be taken, if any, to prevent or delay the onset of dementia? So I think there's probably two answers to that. One is for the person, for your loved one with Alzheimer's disease. And of course, uh, we mentioned a number of ways for slowing the progression of it. The medications are a little bit helpful. Exercise uh, physically and mentally is helpful. Dietary changes, controlling cholesterol, controlling triglycerides, all of those things are things that I would do in someone with the disease. If you're, if you're asking about yourself as someone whose parent might have Alzheimer's disease and you want to know what you can do, it's actually very similar to that in the sense that uh, all of those factors we've already been able to show, at least several of them. We haven't studied all of them yet, but we've been able to show that several of them, like hypertension and diabetes, when controlled, have a significant reducing capability for the development of Alzheimer's disease. And then, of course, if we find something that removes the amyloid in the future, then we're going to give that to you also if you uh, are depositing amyloid already. There's a second question here. Uh, I'm 43 years old. My dad died from Alzheimer's disease. I live in fear of developing it myself. Is it time to try and get tested, and where? Uh, the answer is that it's real tricky, and let me tell you why. We're researching, obviously, whether or not we can detect amyloid in people before they develop the symptoms. And the second part of it is we're researching whether or not we can remove it and therefore prevent the development of the disease. At this time, I don't have a cure or a definite diagnosis method, right? So that means that it's a very personal decision whether or not to be tested now, knowing that I may or may not be able to prevent the development of it. But keep watching with us as we study this. And, and if you uh, have people who could help us uh, monetarily to study this, we would very much appreciate that, because that will allow us to study this so that hopefully down the road I will be able to give you uh, the better news of saying, hey, yes, do come in and get tested because we've figured out how to figure out whether you're depositing it. And I hope in the next few years we can tell you a way that is going to uh, take the amyloid out of your brain so that, uh, that you won't develop it. Are there any theories about how Alzheimer's disease could be transmitted is another question someone asked. Yes, you know, it's really exciting uh, and scary, honestly, at the same time. The data that I showed you suggesting that we could transmit it from one mouse to another. We're looking now to see whether there's any evidence for things like uh, transplants, um, transfusions, other things that we do with each other that might 
allow it to be transmitted. At this time, I wouldn't worry about it, and I don't want to scare anybody, because the answer is I don't know in humans yet. But I can tell you with every patient we're seeing now, we're asking them for all of the things that might result in transmissibility, and we're comparing people with Alzheimer's to other dementias and to controls to try to see whether Alzheimer's patients might have had more transfusions, more uh, transplants, might have had more surgeries, more exposures to other people's body fluids. Um, stay tuned on that. Uh, you know, in, some, in one way I'm hoping we don't find something because I don't want to find that we've been risking each other uh, with these methods. But on the other hand, if we do find something, it'll be really huge in terms of giving us a clue as to why people develop this disease. Another question I got is, how is Alzheimer's or dementia different from normal aging? That's actually a really good question. It turns out between the age of 20 and 80, our attention span changes about 40%. That means that our memory changes by at least 40% because memory requires that we pay close attention to be able to uh, get things into where it's stored. The net effect here is that those of us that are more than halfway to 80 from 20 already notice that our memory is not as good as it used to be. And frankly, if I didn't study this stuff, I would go to see someone because I'd be a little worried that I'm a little more forgetful than I used to be. But the answer is that there is some forgetfulness that's normal if you have a question about whether you're normal or not, get tested. One of the good ways you can do it at home uh, also, by the way, is to compare yourself to your spouse and your friends who are the same age as you. If you're all forgetting the same amount, then God willing, we're probably all on the same curve of, of just getting older. But if you have the sense that it's different from that, come in and get tested and I can tell you, and other people who specialize in this can tell you, if you have more than the normal age-associated changes. Another question came in, if you had a parent with Alzheimer's disease, what is your optimal age to go for testing yourself? I'm not certain about that, and I think in one of the previous questions, I sort of got at the fact that down the road, there will be an optimal age. We will want to see people 10 to 30 years before they're at risk for developing Alzheimer's so we can check them. But right now, since I don't have a cure for it and we're just studying it, I can't tell you the optimal age to be tested. And I, because I don't have the treatment yet. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm very hopeful in the next few years that we will have an answer for that. Let's see another question that came in. What is the blood test that is given to patients during AD workup? That's a good question. There are several blood tests we do. Obviously, we're ruling out thyroid disease, B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, and so forth. But we also, in certain select circumstances, will check genes for Alzheimer's disease. If someone's mom and grandmother and great mother all, grandmother all had the same disease and someone is developing symptoms, in that case, sometimes we look for one of the known genes like presenilin and amyloid precursor protein mutations that might be involved in Alzheimer's disease. We'll send that off so that we can tell a person whether they're at risk or not. And then also we can use it to tell other family members whether they're at risk or not if they have the genetic mutation. Those may be some of the people that we are particularly going to want to study when we're able to, because we know they're going to get Alzheimer's disease at some point, uh, you know, unfortunately. And, but that also creates an opportunity for us to investigate whether or not we can prevent the development of Alzheimer's disease in them. Another question that came in is, how do I find the right doctor to get tested by? Well, you can always start out with your primary care physician. But if you have the sense uh, that you have memory loss or your loved one does, um, you can either go to the primary care person or you can go on to a neurologist. Uh, and there's many, many great ones in the community. Uh, the Mishra Neuroscience Institute uh, and the Mishra Neuroscience Associates have neurologists around town who can test you or who can refer you if they're not certain uh, to folks like myself and other people in the med center who can test you. But from the the majority of people, there's wonderful neurologists around town who can test you for Alzheimer's disease and at least get the ball rolling and help us decide whether or not you're at risk for that. Well, I see it's 101 right now, and I, I don't want to keep going. Uh, I've learned you know, not to go past the finish time with folks. Um, I am available in the Med Center, uh, and as I say, there are under, other wonderful neurologists around town. Um, my appointment number is shown at the end there. 832-325-7080, or you can just look under UT and Memorial Hermann uh, Neurology. There's only one of us in town. 
and uh, to find us and to find our colleagues. Uh, we have neurologists in the Clear Lake area. We have neurologists up in the Woodlands area. We have neurologists on the west side of town uh, who we can refer you to also if they're closer to where you live or if there's some sort of insurance thing that works for them. Thank you so, so much. I hope this has been helpful to you in terms of uh, understanding more about the excitement about what's going on in dementia right now and getting an inkling into folks like why folks like myself who study this are actually so excited right now about the fact that we're making progress into something that has been, you know, frankly kind of difficult to deal with over the years where we had less opportunities available. Now it looks like we're actually uh, very near to the position where we'll be able to uh, diagnose people and uh, treat them more expeditiously. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.